As well as being used for console playing, viols were also used as solo instruments, uh, and the bass in particular found uh, success in this role. The, the evolution of, of solo music for the bass uh, it, it can be sort of divided into two stages. The, the earlier form of the instrument uh, was like this instrument here. It has six strings with uh, strings made from uncovered uh, gut, cow gut in this case. Um, and the music itself took inspiration from uh, the lute style of, uh, of, of solo, solo writing. Uh, and this was named the lira viol style. Uh, typically, it involved a, a small bass, one that was uh, that responded very quickly to the to the touch of the bow on the string, um, and was very 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 chordal in nature, just like you, you would imagine a, a lutenist or a guitarist playing fistfuls of chords. Uh, so the lira viol players um, used very complicated fingerings. Uh, this, of course, is helped by the fact that we play with frets, and this allows complex fingerings while maximizing the resonance of the of the strings. The music itself, rather than being written in what we would expect today, the, the modern notation notes on a stave, uh, was in fact um, tablature, or a form of tab tablature, similar to what guitars, guitar players use today. Um, uh, in, in tab, um, the spaces between the lines represent the strings, uh, and the, each fret is indicated by a letter. So uh, with the rhythms written above the top of the stave, um, it's kind of like playing by numbers, or in this case, playing by letters. Uh, the, the, the score literally tells you which frets you need to play next with which rhythm. And once you become uh, fluent in this style of, uh, of notation, it's actually really helpful and really easy to read. There was a lot of uh, lyre of our music written, and much of it was um, very inventive, often humorous, um, uh, and took dance music as a, as a, um, a, a model. Most of the music is, is dance-based. Um, here's an example of this kind of music. This was written by... Uh, Captain Tobias Hume, who was uh, first and foremost a soldier and uh, and a mercenary, um, but also uh, really quite a talented viol player, um, possibly quite an eccentric person, um, uh, wrote all kinds of funny pieces uh, with titles like Tickle Tickle and Hit It In The Middle, um, but also seems to have drawn inspiration from his experiences as, as a soldier, uh, as this one piece demonstrates. It's called A Soldier's Resolution, and it describes um, the journey of a soldier into battle, uh, and then the fight itself and the march away. You'll see how the frets allow the player to, to create really quite dramatic chordal, uh, chordal writing, chordal playing. Um, it's also full of sound effects, uh, uh, it's very programmatic, um, and a lot of this music is, is really inventive and, and really fun to listen to. Thank you. 
Another important element of the Liravar style was composers experimenting with variations of the tuning of the of the instrument. So rather than sticking with the standard tuning in fourths with a third in the middle, uh, really quite extreme scordatura like uh, tunings were were used, and this allowed the composer and the player to produce um, new sonorities and have access to uh, new chords and uh, uh, new new chord shapes that could uh, radically alter the sound of the music. Hello, I'm going to talk about a type of viol that didn't really feature in the viol consort before the 20th century, as its invention came after the golden age of the viol consort. And the viol I'm referring to is this instrument here, which is a seven string viola da gamba. This particular instrument is a copy of an instrument made in 1683 by a French maker called Michel Collichon. It has a carving of an angel at the top of the peg box. Sometimes you would see a scroll, like on violins and cellos, and some bass vials have beautiful decorations in the form of inlays or marquetry on the fingerboard and fancy purfling on the body. This is a relatively plain instrument, but exactly like its original. Usually, vials come with six strings, but around 1680, in France, a certain Monsieur de saint Colomb, who was a renowned teacher and player, experimented with extending the range of the bass viol downwards by adding an extra low string. This string is tuned to A, a fourth below the bottom D, which was, up to then, the lowest string on the bass. And this is how it sounds. This wonderful sonority and depth was made possible by the invention of wound strings, which enabled bass instruments to play very low notes without having a very long string length. Monsieur de saint Colombe taught one of the most famous names in the viola de gamba world, Marin Marais. Marais earned his reputation partly because he was one of the best players of the instrument at that time, and also because he was a very good composer. He had a humble beginning, but rose to become one of the most successful and respected musicians at the court of Louis XIV. He published around 600 pieces for the viola de gamba, mostly for one viol and a basso continuo, but some are for two bass viols, and there are even pieces for three bass viols. Here is a beautiful little prelude by him to demonstrate. Thank you. 
In the Baroque period, the bass viol became a favourite chamber music instrument, particularly within the aristocratic amateur circles, who delighted in posing with their seven-string basses in portraits of this period. Viol players were employed at court and in the best households, and luthiers around Europe, including from the workshops of Joachim Tilke in Germany, Barak Norman in London, and even Antonius Tradivari in Italy, produced some of the finest examples money could buy. Many important Baroque composers wrote for the viola de gamba. Georg Philipp Telemann used the viol extensively in his chamber works and published twelve solo fantasias for it. Johann Sebastian Bach wrote three sonatas and obligato parts for the viol in his cantatas and oratorios. During his tenure in Curtin, Bach met the acquaintance of a certain Christian Ferdinand Abel, who was a court violinist and viol player. His son, Karl Friedrich Abel, became one of the last virtuoso players of the instrument in the 18th century. He lived and worked in London, where he organised a successful concert series in Soho Square with Johann Christian Bach, J.S.'s youngest son. He also befriended the painter Thomas Gainsborough, who was himself a viol player, a keen amateur player. Gainsborough painted two beautiful portraits of Abel depicting him with his viola de gamba. I'm going to play to you an unaccompanied solo by Abel. Abel was famous for his improvisations, and this piece, built on chord progressions played in a fast, arpeggiated way, to me has a mesmerising, almost hypnotic quality that would have certainly wowed his listeners. <laughs> happened to the viol during the Romantic period, although there is now evidence to show that the instrument was still being played throughout the 19th century. After the early music revival in the 20th century, the viola de gamba regained the popularity it once enjoyed in the 17th and 18th centuries. New music is written for the instrument, either for solo or for consort, and the viola de gamba is combined with other instruments in different genres such as folk, jazz, electronic music, and others. I'm going to play to you a short movement called Mirada, and Mirada means a look or a glance, and this is from a suite composed in 2016 by the Spanish composer Carlos Martinez Gil. Mm. 